I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. To the weak, but can't find that quitter with me. It's that bit of sweet literature that Lydia Streets walk with the Prince of Peace. See what he's for. Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to talk about pulmonary embolisms. So what is a pulmonary embolism? Well, a pulmonary embolism is a clot in the lungs. What that means is that a lot of times we form clots in our legs that are due to various factors, cancers, immobility, what have you. And these clots can break off and then travel up our venous circulation to our hearts and eventually out into the pulmonary vasculature. One of these small branches off the pulmonary artery is clogged up by this clot. So, those alveoli that are getting all the oxygen when you take a deep breath are not able to transport this oxygen to the vessel that is surrounding them because this clot is blocking off blood flow. So this results in what's called a ventilation perfusion defect. You have part of the lung getting oxygen, but the perfusion of that blood vessel or that blood vessel that surrounds the alveoli that normally picks up the oxygen has no blood flow through it. This is called a ventilation perfusion defect or ventilation perfusion mismatch. This concept is very important when we talk about imaging and diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism. Now, just like with any other disease, pulmonary embolisms present in very different ways. So some symptoms and signs you should look out for are one, respiratory distress. You see the patient over the bedside tripoding, or they just complain of having trouble breathing. Two, shock. Patients with blood pressure is just dropping. You do not know why. They don't have any infection signs, but they still are hypotensive. Tachycardia. The patient's sitting there, their heart rate's racing at 125, and you don't have any explanation for it. Chest pain. They complain of really bad chest pain, but they have no cardiac history. Your EKG may be normal, um, but it doesn't look like a cardiac etiology. So what else could be causing it? And in the very rare case, the patient could be asymptomatic. So there's a very large degree of severity that can occur and patients can present with. So you need to keep your eye out. So let's talk about the diagnosis of PE. It's generally a step-by-step -step approach. First things first, you need to do a clinical probability assessment. You need to understand what's the likelihood that this patient actually has a PE. Two, you need to consider, does this patient need a D-dimer test? And we'll talk about what exactly that is. And finally, three, what imaging can you obtain or should you obtain, whether it's a CTPE study or a VQ scan? So first, let's talk about clinical probability assessment. The main clinical probability assessment tool we use is called the Wells score. The Wells score consists of different criteria and a point system. So let's go over it. So if you have a clinical symptoms of a PE, you get three points. If PE is a likely diagnosis, you get three points. If you have a previous history of DVT, that means a clot in your legs or upper extremities, or a PE, you get 1.5 points. If you have a history of immobilization or surgery in the past four weeks, you get another 1.5 points. If your heart rate's greater than 100, you get another 1.5 points. A history of cancer, with especially with treatment in the past six months, you get a point. And finally, hemoptysis, meaning coughing up blood, you get another point. When you add all that up, based on your patient, if they have four points or less, they have a low probability of a PE. If they have greater than four points, they have a higher probability of a PE. The clinical probability assessment will dictate how you treat the patient. So whatever their well score is will tell you what to do next. Now one test we have to cover is called the D-dimer test. What the D-dimer test is, it's a test that measures fibrin degradation products. What that is is when you form a clot, fibrin needs to be cleaved. In that cleavage to form fibrin, you create a degradation product. So anytime you form a clot, whether it be from a trauma, whether it be from getting your labs drawn and having to be stuck, your D-dimer gets slightly elevated. Now, it is only useful 
if a patient has a low clinical probability, meaning if you assess a patient and they have a low clinical probability, it is okay to get a D-dimer. If that D-dimer is negative with a low clinical probability, then you can say that this patient likely does not have a PE. But in any other situation, the D-dimer is not useful. So if a patient has a high probability and the D-dimer is negative, that does not mean anything. Now realize, D-dimer will be high or positive in almost anyone and everyone in the hospital. Just because they get frequent lab draws, uh, they come in for other things, they may have chronic kidney disease, so many other things contribute to a D-dimer being high besides them having a PE or a clot. So keep that in the back of your mind. A high D-dimer does not mean clot. But a low D-dimer in a patient with a low clinical probability can help you rule out a clot. So do not order this test if a patient does have a high clinical probability. Two, I would avoid it in patients with chronic kidney disease just because the likelihood it's going to be negative is very low. Just because to get rid of these fiber and degradation products, you need good kidney function. And in chronic kidney disease patients, they're going to retain this. And thus, their D-dimers are generally going to be high. Patients with cancer history, again, probably not a test you want because probably their well score is going to be greater than 4. So just keep in mind the clinical situation when you order a D-dimer and assess whether it's appropriate or not. Now the next step is imaging. Let's first talk about chest x-rays. So chest x-rays are not used to diagnose PEs, but there are some interesting findings that you can note on a chest x-ray. The most important thing to note was called a Hampton's hump. You can compare these two chest x-rays and you see this on the right side, this mound or hill. This is called the Hampton hump. What it represents is when a clot clogs off a vessel, the remaining tissue that's perfused by that vessel does not get the nutrients and oxygen it needs and it causes cell death or infarction. And this results in what's called Hampton's hump. Now this sign should not be used for diagnosis, but merely for clinical suspicion of a PE. The imaging modality we generally use to diagnose pulmonary embolisms is a CT study. So let's look at the findings you see on a CAT scan for pulmonary embolisms. So on a CTPE study, you're looking at the vasculature. You're giving dye specifically to see the dye flow through the vasculature, making sure it flows very well. Now to diagnose a PE, you will see defects in the flow of the IV dye. So normally the IV dye lights up all the vessels bright white. And if you see dark matter or dark shading within that vessel as circled here, you can diagnose a PE that way. And that's how radiologists diagnose PEs for these studies. But keep in mind that CTPE studies are not the only modality for diagnosing PEs. We also have what's called a VQ scan. So let's talk about the different imaging studies for diagnosing PEs. We talked about the CTPE study, and you're looking for perfusion defects to diagnose your pulmonary embolism. The other modality you can use is called the VQ scan. And the VQ scan looks for ventilation perfusion mismatches or defects. Remember this concept we talked about before in the beginning. We use this scan in patients who have poor renal function, so they have acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. Also, if a patient cannot get a CTP study because they're very, very allergic to the IV dye, for example, developing anaphylactic shock, you may not want to pre-medicate them and try the CTPE. You may just want to try a VQ scan instead. If a VQ scan is negative, its negative predictive value is 97%. So it's a very good study if it's negative, basically saying you don't have a PE. If it's positive, the positive predictive value is 85 to 90%, which is generally pretty good. When you get the results from a VQ scan, it's read as either low probability, intermediate probability, or high probability. If you have a low probability, it's clear, and if you have a high probability, that's clear. But 
what if a study comes back as intermediate probability? You don't know whether you have a clot. You don't know whether you should treat the patient. What should you do? Well, you should base your decision on their clinical picture. Does a clinical picture really look like a PE? If it does, then you can proceed with anticoagulant or treating them. And that's what a VQ scan really shows and really gives us. Now, there have been studies recently on the use of MRI, specifically what's called MRA, to look at the arterial vasculature using an MRI machine and to identify pulmonary perfusion defects or pulmonary embolisms. So a study, short name PyoPed3, basically looked at imaging modalities and diagnosing pulmonary embolisms. They looked at MRI because if MRI was successful, it would mean you could do these studies to diagnose PE and patients would have a lot less exposure to radiation because MRI uses magnets and not really radiation to obtain images. But the MRA studies had insufficient sensitivity for diagnosing pulmonary embolisms and had a very high rate of technically poor images. So they're found to be poor studies to diagnose PE. So that's why we still use CAT scans and VQ scans to diagnose PEs. Now, what's your diagnostic workup for a PE? We talked about the different clinical assessments, the D-dimer as well as imaging studies, but how do you lay this out in kind of uh, an algorithm? Well, if your patients are hemodynamically stable and they have a pretty much low probability for PE, then go ahead and do the D-dimer. The D-dimer is negative, your PE is ruled out. If it's positive, go ahead and obtain imaging. Now, now for patients who are hemodynamically unstable, so if they have shock or hy slash hypotension, what do you do? Well, for hemodynamically unstable patients who are not critically ill, if a CAT scan is available, you can proceed with a CTPE study. If a CAT scan is unavailable, then you can proceed with an echocardiogram, either transthoracic or transesophageal. What are you looking for in an echocardiogram? You're looking for right ventricular dysfunction, and that would confirm a PE. Now, why right ventricular dysfunction? Picture this. You have a pump attached to a long pipe. In this case, the long pipe represents your pulmonary vasculature, and the pump represents your right ventricle. So normally, the pump will push fluid through that pipe and have really no problem. Now, what happens if something blocks off that pipe? Now, the pump is trying to push fluid into that pipe, and it's meeting resistance. The more and more fluid that pushes into the pipe, the more and more pressure builds up in the pipe, and the more and more resistance is created by that increase in fluid and pressure in the pipe. That will kind of back up and it will start destroying the pump. Same thing, when you have a PE or clot in your pulmonary vasculature, your right ventricle is still pumping against that blocked vessel. And when it does that, it meets greater and greater resistance, which changes the pump or the right ventricle itself, and it causes dysfunction in that right ventricle. It can actually be so severe if you have multiple chronic PEs, we would develop right heart failure. So that is why you're looking for right ventricular dysfunction on the echocardiogram. Now, if a patient's critically ill, they can't make it to this CAT scan, then you could do an echocardiogram and look for the RV dysfunction. If it's there, you have a PE. If it's not there, you're gonna think why are they having hypotension? Look for alternate causes. So what's the treatment for PEs? Well, initial therapy is either sub-Q low molecular weight heparin, fondaparinox or lovenox, and IV unfractionated heparin drip. So what do you do in this case? So basically for initial therapy, you can put them on a heparin drip and then bridge them to long-term therapy, and we'll talk about that. You can also use things such as lovenox to anticoagulate them. And or you can use low molecular weight heparin as well. The judgment whether to use each medication will be on a case-by-case -case basis, and we'll look at some special situations that can differentiate between these various medications. But once you've put them on initial therapy of one of these medications, you need to really think about long-term therapy. The most common long-term therapy is Coumadin or Warfarin, and it is a vitamin K antagonist. The difficulty with warfarin is kind of twofold. 
First off, when you start a patient on warfarin, because of their effects on certain factors, specifically protein C and protein S, a patient actually becomes hypercoagulable in the first few days, meaning they have a greater tendency to clot off, though they're on this medication to prevent their clotting. It's kind of paradoxical thinking. So that's why when a patient started on a Coumadin initially, we bridge them with either Lovenox or a heparin drip. Now we monitor Coumadin with INRs, and once we hit a goal of two to three, we can stop these bridges. Now unfortunately, some of the drawbacks with Coumadin is that not only can it cause bleeding, but patients need to have frequent monitoring of these INRs to make sure they're within that therapeutic range. Now there's new therapies that are out, uh, such as Pradaxa, which is a thrombin inhibitor, or, or Rivaroxaban, which is a 10A inhibitor, that do not require this frequent monitoring. These are oral agents, but they're contraindicated in renal or hepatic impairment, so you need to keep an eye out on their kidney and liver function. But these are starting to be used for like AFib, and there have been studies with PEs, so something to remember and look out for to see if they actually become kind of mainstream therapy. Now there are two exceptions to the use of these long-term therapy agents. So first is in pregnant women. You cannot use vitamin K antagonists like Coumadin in pregnant women because they have fatal effects on the fetus. And two is in cancer patients. There have been studies that compared low molecular weight heparin to Coumadin in patients with cancer and found that the better morbidity and mortality with low molecular weight heparin as the pair compared to Coumadin because of the adverse consequences due to monitoring and fluctuation of levels associated with Coumadin. So any patients that fit in these two groups use low molecular heparin with no Coumadin as a long-term therapy. So that's a brief review of pulmonary embolisms. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a like. Make sure to drop your knowledge on some friends. So share this video with Facebook, Google+, and on Twitter. If you have any comments about this video or any questions, make sure to put them down below or any suggestions for any future videos. And last but not least, most importantly, subscribe. We also have a podcast on iTunes called iMed School where you can download these videos and watch them on your iPhone or iPad. This is Dr. K from iMedical School and I'll see you next time.